logical fallacy. And a logical fallacy is basically a failure of reasoning. So it's important as a reader to recognize logical fallacies because they diminish the value of the author's message. So since circular reasoning is a type of logical fallacy, we could also call circular reasoning a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, we can define it as reasoning that offers no support for assertions other than restating them in different words. So another way to define this is we could say circular arguments refer to themselves as evidence of truth. So if you find, some, find an argument that refers to itself as evidence of truth, then you know it's a circular argument. Now, circular reasoning is one of the more difficult logical fallacies to identify because it is typically hidden behind dense language and complicated sentences. Now, a simple example of circular argument is when a person uses a word to define itself. Like right here where it says niceness is the state of being nice. So if you as the reader do not know what the word nice means, then this sentence won't be of very much help to you. Now, Right here we have a little bit of a more complicated example and this is what you are more likely to find in your reading. It says poverty is a problem for society because it creates trouble for people throughout the community. So it is redundant to say that poverty is a problem because it creates trouble. So when an author engages in circular reasoning like this right here, it is either because he or she has not fully thought out the argument or because they cannot come up with any legitimate justifications. Adverbs make writing clearer and more interesting. So an adverb describes another word. And so it can describe three different parts of speech. So it can describe a verb, an adjective, or even another adverb. And so an adverb completes one of four tasks. It, e it can either tell how, when, where, or to what extent. So an adverb is going to describe a verb, an adjective, an adverb, and it's going to tell how, or when, or where, or to what extent. So I have three sentences right here, each with an adverb, so we're going to take a look at those. So this first one says, Mandy drove slowly. So we see an adverb right here of slowly. It ends in L-Y. And so a good way to find an adverb is by looking for a word that has the suffix of L-Y. Now not all adverbs end in L-Y, and not all L-Y words are adverbs. So you still have to use your brain and look specifically at the word but that's a good way to identify adverbs. So we have the adverb slowly and it's describing drove. And so drove is a verb. And so slowly is describing drove. It's telling the reader how Mandy was driving, slowly. Now in this sentence we see he drove really fast. And so here we find another L-Y word, really. Now really isn't describing drove. We're not saying he really drove. We're saying he drove really fast. So really is describing fast. So I'm gonna circle fast and in this case, fast is an adjective. So in this sentence, adverb really describes the adjective fast. So it's telling the reader how quickly he drove. Now this last sentence says we like to cook out quite often. So we see two adverbs here, neither of which ends in ly, quite and often. So in this case, we're going to look at this adverb, quite. And quite is describing often. So it's describing another adverb. So here we've seen three examples of three different adverbs, one describing a verb, one describing an adjective, and one describing another adverb. Allusion. Allusion is an unsighted but recognizable reference to something else. Usually it's going to be a reference to something else in literature. Authors use allusions to make their own text richer. 
When an author uses an allusion, it gives their own writing the same significance or context that the allusion had. Let's look at some examples. Martin Luther King Jr. started his I Have a Dream speech by saying five score years ago. This is a clear allusion to President Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Lincoln started with four score and seven years ago. So, even though Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't saying the exact same thing, he started out with five score years ago, which is similar enough that people knew he was alluding to President Lincoln's speech. This reminded people of the significance of the event. And in reminding people of the significance of the Gettysburg Address, it lent significance to the speech that Martin Luther King was making. Let's look at some, some other examples. Scrooge. If someone is alluded to as Scrooge, or there's a Scrooge reference in writing, it's going to be someone who is not very generous. They're kind of miserly. They don't like to share. And that would be something that you would have seen in A Christmas Carol where he goes around and sees what his life would be like if he weren't there and realizes to change his ways. But Scrooge was a very miserly man who didn't want to share with people who really needed it. If you see Pinocchio, it's a reference to someone who is lying. If you see a Trojan horse, it means someone who, or something that is a trick. It looks like the real thing, but really there's a trap concealed inside. An Achilles heel is... A reference to Achilles from Greek mythology and his heel was his one weak spot so your Achilles heel would be your weak spot where someone could really get to you a Romeo from Romeo and Juliet Romeo would be someone who was really good with women someone who really loved to you know take girls out on dates and was really good at you know getting girls to go out on dates with them Turn the other cheek is a biblical reference when Jesus told people that they shouldn't seek revenge but should instead turn the other cheek if they're slapped once. Turn the other cheek so you can get hit on the other side of your face. And it's just his metaphor for saying don't seek revenge. That's not the Christian way. Solomon is another biblical reference. He was a very wise king, so if you're referred to as um, someone who's like Solomon, it means you've got a lot of wisdom. And a good Samaritan is another biblical reference, and it refers to the good Samaritan on the road who helped someone when no one else would. So a good Samaritan today is someone who helps people or helps a person that no one else is trying to help. So allusions can be used to ground text in a particular time or place, or they can use a cultural reference to make readers feel included. There are lots of reasons that a writer would use allusions, but every time that you use an allusion, it's meant to make your text richer and give your text more than it had before. So when you're reading, watch for allusions. And if you see one of these references, say to yourself, oh, that's an allusion. I learned about those. It's here to make the text richer. And think to yourself, what connotations do you get? How do you feel differently reading that word in the text? What did that word or reference do for your interpretation of the text? Because really, that's what allusion is there for. It's to add to the text and make it better. An essay where you are asked to compare and contrast is extremely prevalent and very popular, so you're probably going to be asked to write one of these types of essays at some point. So it's important that you are prepared to do that. So look at this example, running and swimming as forms of exercise. So in this example, you'd be asking to compare and, con and contrast running and swimming. So look at running and swimming and talk about how they are alike. That's the compare part of it. And the contrast part is talking about how running and swimming are different. But remember, you're not just talking about running and swimming. You're talking about them as forms of exercise. 
So think about how running and swimming are similar in terms of exercise and how they are different forms of exercise as well. So there are a few things to remember when writing one of these essays. First, have purpose. Don't just compare and contrast something just to do it. Have some kind of purpose. Like that way your reader can determine which is the best form. Or sometimes it's to show your reader which is the best choice. Then pick your style. Sometimes you can go back and forth. Like you can talk about how running and swimming are alike in this way and then talk about how they're alike in this way. Or you can just talk about running, keep talking about running, and then talk about swimming. So the choice is talk about running and then swimming or talk about running and swimming back and forth throughout the entire essay. The choice is yours. Just decide which one is most effective. And then finally, derive purpose. Now I know I just put that up there, but it's very important. Don't just write an essay where the reader comes to the end of it wondering why they even read your essay. Give them some kind of purpose to comparing and contrasting the things that you have been talking about through the entire paper. So remember those things and you'll be on your way to writing a great essay. Conflict. Conflict is a central element of plot in any piece of literature. And it is going to be the struggle or problem around which the plot centers. So whenever you're thinking about conflict, think about problem. What is the problem in the story? What is it that they're trying to figure out a solution to? What is it that everyone's worried about? That's going to be your main problem or your conflict. Now when you're deciding what the conflict is, there are generally two basic types. You have external conflict and external conflict is just what it sounds like. When the main character has a struggle with another force. It's external. So when the main character has a struggle with another force, the conflict is external. Um, an example with, of another force would be another character or a force of nature. So having a problem with another character is pretty self-explanatory. They have some problem with another character. They think the character is doing something wrong and want to fix it. They are mad at another character. They are in love with another character. That's going to be having a conflict or a problem with that other character that needs to be resolved, and that would be an external conflict. Or it could be with a force of nature. Forces of nature are external. They are outside of the main character, and so that makes it an external conflict. An example of a force of nature being the main conflict source would be if there was a bad storm coming. That storm is a force of nature and it could be the conflict. Or if a man is trapped on an island, that would be a conflict because they're trapped there. All of nature is keeping them there. They can't get away. Um, and the struggle to survive could be another conflict with nature. The other basic type of conflict would be an internal conflict. So we had external where the problem was outside. So internal conflict is when a character has a problem, when the main character has a problem that they're struggling with internally. So when the main character has a struggle within him or herself. So it isn't anything outside. It isn't, it isn't anything other people are affecting. So they could influence it with their actions, but the problem is really going to reside within that person. An example of that would be deciding between right and wrong. Other people can tell you, this is right, this is wrong. One person may say, it's all right to steal a loaf of bread if you're hungry and you have no money. Someone else may tell you, it's wrong to do that because it's still stealing. So it's an internal conflict within that character when they have to decide for themselves if something is right or wrong. 
So whenever you're looking at conflict, whenever you're trying to find what that conflict is in a story, look at what the main problem is. And to delve deeper and better understand the conflict, ask yourself if it's an external conflict or an internal conflict. Remembering that external is going to be when a character is struggling with another force, something outside of him or herself, another character or a force of nature. And an internal character is going to be when the main character has a problem within him or herself where they have to decide something only on, based on what's inside, not any external force. Good example, deciding between right and wrong. The most important thing to remember is what conflict is. So just keep saying to yourself, a conflict is a problem. A conflict is a problem. And that should help you be able to figure out what the conflict is in any story. Context. Sometimes when you're reading and you come across a word that you don't know, you can use context clues to make an educated guess as to what the word means. Now when you're looking at the word you don't know, you don't want to just look right before and after the word. You usually want to look at the sentence before and the sentence after. And sometimes you even have to look at the whole paragraph to get an idea of what that unfamiliar word means. Now, there are some clues that we can look at to help determine what the word means. One thing you can look at is a description. Sometimes a sentence or a sentence following or before the unfamiliar word will give you a description. For instance, the green feathered macaw. Well, you may not know the word macaw, but by seeing green feathered, you can infer that it is some kind of a bird with green feathers. Another clue you can look at are synonyms. If you hear the soft and supple leather, well since you have soft here and then supple both describing leather, you can figure out that supple probably has something to do with being soft. And in reality, it means moldable. It's easily moldable. And it is somewhat soft to be able to do that. We'll go ahead and note that this one was our bird. Now another clue you can look for are antonyms. Angie is sweet. She doesn't have a malevolent bone in her body. Well, you may not know what malevolent means, but you probably know what sweet means. And if she isn't malevolent and she is sweet, then you can figure out malevolent is something bad, something negative, the opposite of sweet. And in reality, malevolent means evil. Another clue you can look for are definitions. Sometimes the sentence before, after, or part of the same sentence your word is in will just give you the definition of the word. For instance, the echidna, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia, and then they might tell you some interesting fact about the echidna. Well, in commas, right after echidna is the definition of an echidna, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia. So you know what it is right there. The last clue you can look for is tone. Is the rest of this paragraph positive, negative, happy, scared? If you have a paragraph that's all one tone, then the word probably has something to do with that. If it's a scary tone, then this may be a word that it has to do with something scary. If it's positive, it may be a happy kind of word. So you can always take that into consideration whenever you are taking your educated guess. So once you've looked at clues and you've tried to figure out looking before and after the sentence your word is in, looking at the whole paragraph, seeing if you can find a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or figure out the tone surrounding that unfamiliar word, you want to take a guess as to what the word means. And then you want to reread the sentence to see if it makes sense to you and ask yourself, does it make sense? So if we were to insert bird here, the green feathered bird. Well, if it's something that has feathers and we have bird after it, that makes sense, so that one would work. The soft and supple leather. So if we know it means something else soft, maybe moldable, we could say the soft and moldable leather, the soft and flexible leather. Any kind of word like that that you put in that was similar to soft would work. It would make sense in your sentence. Okay. 
We were thinking evil here, something the opposite of sweet. Angie is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone in her body. That makes sense. She is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone. Now, the echidna sentence is a little different. If they plug in a definition for you, then it's a little harder to check. You would just say, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia, and then maybe tell the sentence after that point because the definition's already there for you. There's not really a synonym for echidna or anything else you could have come up with for what that one meant. And once you've checked to make sure they all make sense, then you have a pretty good idea of what that word means. And you can see how using these context clues of looking for a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or the tone of a paragraph can help you figure out that pesky, unfamiliar word. Many times readers come across words that they are unfamiliar with. So it's important that readers understand how to determine the definition of a word based on its context. This means looking at the words around it and how the word is used in the sentence. Let's look at a couple of examples. This first example says the elderly scholar spent his evenings hunched over arcane text that few other people even knew existed. So the unfamiliar word here is arcane, but you will see that you can pretty much determine the definition of that word based on the words around it. Here we see the word elderly coming before scholar. So if only an elderly scholar would be studying these texts, then it means that it must be some kind of complex subject that only someone who has acquired much knowledge and wisdom would understand. And then we also see that it says that few other people even knew existed. So that means it's something rare or something that only a few people would know about. So here we have easily and quickly determined the definition of, our, of arcane. This next sentence says, Ron's fealty to his parents was not shared by Karen, who disobeyed, disobeyed their every command. Now you'll notice here that there's not very many words that tell us the definition of fealty. Instead, we see words that tell us what fealty is not. Because here it says, Karen, who disobeyed their every command. Here, Ron is being contrasted with Karen. So if fealty is not disobeying their every command, then fealty must mean obeying or being faithful to. Because notice here we're seeing that Karen disobeys their every command, but Ron does not. So Ron must mean not disobeying. In other words, it means obeying. So you see here how by looking at context clues, a reader can quickly determine the definition of a word. And although it may not be the exact definition, it generally, generally will be the definition for that word in that particular sentence. And so this can be very helpful because it helps a reader be more efficient because determining the definition of a word based on context is much quicker than consulting a dictionary or a thesaurus. Figurative language. Figurative language is language that goes beyond the literal meaning of a word, and authors will use figurative language to enhance their writing. Some common examples of figurative language are hyperbole, simile, metaphor, and personification. So we'll discuss each of those, and I'll give you some examples for each. Hyperbole is exaggeration. People will say something, and you aren't meant to take it literally. You're meant to know it's an exaggeration, but it's there just to emphasize how strongly the author is trying to convey something. For instance, I've told you a million times. I bet some of you have probably heard that one. And a million times, really? Probably you haven't heard whatever your parent or teacher has said they've told you a million times. It's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole. It's meant to emphasize that they've already told you this a lot more times before now. Another example would be, I had a ton of homework. You did not literally go home with 2,000 pounds of homework, but you're telling people, I had a lot of homework. It was way more than the normal amount. It was a ton. It was that much homework. So that's what hyperbole is, exaggeration. Next, we've got simile, which is comparing two things using like or as. 
And this is very important. You have to use those words like or as, or it's not going to be a simile anymore. So, the child howled like a coyote. We see our word like. You're comparing two things in this sentence. The child howled like a coyote compares the child to a coyote using the word like. This example is letting you know that the child is loud. It's crying sounds like a howl, much like a coyote. So this figurative language is used to bring a coyote to mind to help you picture and hear in your mind how this child is screaming or crying. Next, let's look at this example. She ran as fast as lightning. Well, that's going to compare two things here, and we see the word as. So what is being compared in this sentence? She ran as fast as lightning. And usually when you have one as, you've got two. So it's comparing she, or a girl, to lightning. And that is being done by using the word as. So when you're comparing a girl to lightning, you're saying she's that fast. It went so fast you barely got to see her before she got past you or got to the finish line. So it's just letting you know she's really, really fast. So that's what simile is, comparing two things using like or as. And again, these are the important words to look for to make it actually be a simile. It could be a metaphor, which compares two things without using like or as. And that is really the big difference between a simile and a metaphor. A simile uses like or as. A metaphor does not use like or as. So let's look at some metaphor examples. She was lightning running down the track. So this sentence is very similar to this one. They're both comparing she or a girl to lightning. They're both saying this girl is really fast, but this one just says she was lightning. She was lightning running down the track. It doesn't say she ran as fast as lightning. It doesn't use like or as, it just says she was lightning. So it's a different way to use the same kind of figurative language. So that's one example of a metaphor. Let's look at this. And this is an excerpt from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. Now this one's a little trickier because it doesn't just come out and say this was this or this is this. Like here it said she was lightning. But it says that his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. So we're comparing his eyes to a demon's eyes which is basically comparing him or a man to a demon. If his eyes are like a demon's eyes, then this man is being compared to a demon, which is to maybe say that the man is evil. It doesn't mean he's literally a demon. It means he's got some characteristic of a demon. He's maybe an evil person. So in poetry, your figurative language may not always pop out at you if it's a metaphor. A simile is pretty easy to spot because you'll see like or as, but a metaphor might be a little trickier. So just look for what two things are being compared in that sentence or that phrase of a poem. And the last piece of figurative language we're going to discuss is personification which is when an inanimate object is given human qualities. You are personifying it. You are making it do something a person would do even though it's not something that can do these things. And remember, inanimate objects are going to be things that are not alive. A chair, a teapot, the wind, water, those are inanimate objects. So the example here, the water slapped the side of the boat. The water slapped. Can water actually slap like a person would slap? No, but it makes you think of 
the action of slapping and the sound you might hear with the slap whenever you picture this water slapping the side of the boat. And that's why they're using this particular word and personifying the water. Depending on what the story is about where this sentence appears, it could be that the water is being made as like a, an evil character. If someone drowns in this story, then the water would be seen as an enemy. And so it slapping the side of the boat would give it that negative feeling. Another example, the teapot shrieked. Shrieking, screaming, that loud sound, you can hear it in your head when you think about the noise a teapot makes. But a teapot isn't actually shrieking like a person would. It's simply making that noise because the air is hot enough that it's trying to get out now. Or the wind howled. Wind can't howl like a wolf would howl, but wind makes that same kind of sound sometimes. And so the author is trying to put that sound of howling in your mind when they're describing the wind. So figurative language can be a lot of different things. Hyperbole, where you're exaggerating. Simile, where you're comparing two things using like or as. Very important markers for a simile. Metaphor, where you're comparing two things without using like or as. And personification, when an object is given human qualities, whenever it's personified. And all of these techniques are used so that the words will go beyond the literal meaning of them and give you a deeper understanding of the poem or the work that you're reading. The author is trying to go beyond the words and make you really think about their meaning and put certain connotations in your head whenever you're reading. Historical context. Historical context can impact literature in a number of ways. The author's writing can be impacted by the historical period during which it was written or the historical setting of the story. For instance, when Charles Dickens was writing, he was writing during a period where authors were paid by the word, which meant that his novels were very, very long. And that was the result of the time period during which his work was written. He was writing long novels because he knew he would get paid more for every word that he wrote. Dialect is something else you can pay attention to. The dialect could be what the author is used to using in his everyday life, or the dialect could be more related to the historical setting of the story. So dialect is something you want to pay attention to and ask yourself, is this the dialect used during the setting, or is this more of just the author using his own personal dialect that he is used to? Another thing to pay attention to with historical setting is major events that are going on. You want to be familiar with the time period during which a story is set so you can have a better understanding of it. So, um, one example is the Civil War. During the Civil War, slavery was the normal thing in the South. And whenever the Civil War is over, lots of slaves or people that used to be slaves wanted to tell their story. And so what came about were slave narratives. And these painted a picture of what slave, -like, slave life was actually like during that time. It was a, an actual account from that time period. And it, it kind of also told the relationship between slaves and slaveholders. So that source of writing is very valuable and it's become one of the most important literary genres for African American writers. Today, people may still write from that perspective in that time period, but the actual slave narratives that gave first-hand accounts were very important. Another thing to pay attention to with Civil War writing, slave narratives, um, anything from that time period are the themes. A lot of times you'll see themes of power, race, inequality. Because when slavery ended, it was because people were saying, your skin color doesn't make you more or less of a person or a better or worse person. Everyone's equal. And while equal rights didn't come about till later, it started that theme of equality around the Civil War time. Another major event that's common is World War II. There are countless novels based around World War II events, whether it's based in Nazi Germany, 
whether it's based in America, um, as people are dealing with what was going on here. But one of the biggest things that you'll see is the topic of genocide, destroying a whole race. Um, so your Jewish Nazi relations, you're going to see a lot of. Um, Anne Frank, very, very popular book, one that most people are going to know about, was based on this. And if you know the World War II era, then you know what to expect when you're reading. You know that the Nazis are trying to take over most of Europe. You know that the Jews are being persecuted. And you've already got that bit of background knowledge before you even read the rest of the book. And with World War II novels, you're again going to see themes of race, power, and democracy. Because in the end, people were going to say that having a government where some totalitarian dictator took over everything wasn't the best way to be. And you're going to see people highlighting the pros of democracy. So whenever you're reading, really pay attention to the historical context of the story because the historical period during which it was written is always going to have an impact and the historical setting is going to be very important for you to understand so that you can understand why the author gave the character certain motivations and why the author carried out the plot as they did. Inference. Inferences are conclusions that a reader makes using clues in the text. So an author may not explicitly say something, but they leave little hints behind and you have to connect the dots to form a conclusion. And inference is different than making a guess because it is based on evidence. So you read, you pick up on those clues or hints that the author leaves behind and you put them all together to form your inference. So let's look at a couple of examples. Charlotte's toddler is in bed asleep upstairs. She hears a loud thump and then loud crying. So knowing that the toddler is in bed asleep and then hearing a thump and crying, you can infer, or Charlotte can infer when she's at home, that her toddler fell out of bed. Now, our example doesn't say the toddler fell out of bed, and it doesn't say Charlotte ran upstairs and found her child on the floor, but because you know the kid was in a, in a bed sleeping, and then you hear a thump, probably against the floor, and then crying because the kid is hurt or scared from waking up in the middle of the night on the floor unexpectedly, Charlotte can infer that her toddler fell out of bed, or the reader can infer that that's what, happening, what happened whenever they're trying to process the story and figure out what the author was trying to tell them with these clues. So let's look at another example. Nolan sees cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth. So cookie crumbs on the floor, chocolate around his mouth is going to tell you that Nolan's son got into the cookie jar. And it may not be the cookie jar, it may be that he got into a pack of cookies, but you don't really know the rest of that. You just know that if there are cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth, that the kid got into cookies somehow. So you can infer he got into a cookie jar or a pack of cookies without knowing, without the author explicitly saying that to you. And that's all it is. That's all inferences. Reading something and coming to a conclusion. A lot of the times it's really obvious things. If you see a lady come into a store and she's dripping wet and it's raining outside, you can infer that she doesn't have an umbrella. So some things are just common sense. They come to you. You don't even realize you're making an inference. But in the end, an, it, an inference is just a conclusion that a reader makes based on evidence. Let's talk about literary genres. 
A genre is basically a category. So take music, for example. There are many different types of musical genres, such as rock, classical, pop, and country. So a musical genre is basically just a category of music. In the same way, a literary genre is basically a category of literature. It's when you take similar works of literature and group them together in different categories. It's also important to remember that the criteria for genres is always changing. Literary experts have differing views on which genres should exist and the criteria for those genres. So it's hard for me just to write up here on the board all the literary genres that exist because it's not cut and dry. Different literary experts have different views on which ones exist. And then when you start looking at the literary genres, it can get confusing from there because then you have sub-genres that come from those literary genres. Take, for example, the two simplest uh, genres, nonfiction and fiction. Nonfiction being a true story and fiction being a made-up story. Sometimes, sometimes authors will combine those two genres by writing about a true story but changing the names of the characters. So then it's both a nonfiction story and a fiction story, creating a third genre. So take a look at some other genres out there. Take nonfiction, for example. You have the genre of nonfiction, but then you can split that up into the subgenres of essay, memoir, and then there's others as well. Or if you look at the Greek classification system of genres, you have poetry, drama, and prose. But poetry can be divided up into the subgenres sub of lyric and epic, and drama can be split up into the subgenres of comedy and tragedy. Comedy being a uh, drama with a good ending, and a tragedy being a drama with a bad ending. But then the subgenre of comedy can be split up into more subgenres, such as a comedy of manners and a sentimental comedy. So you can see how confusing the classif classification system can get. But don't be overwhelmed by that. The main thing you need to remember is that a literary genre is a category of literature. Persuasive essays. When writing a persuasive essay, the writer will try to convince the reader to adopt the opinion of the writer on a particular issue. They do this in many different ways, but they should demonstrate a keen understanding of their audience. You need to know who you're writing to, who you're trying to convince of this opinion. Consider the interests prior knowledge, and learning styles of the audience. So think about who you're writing to. Are they going to be interested in this topic to start with, or are you going to have to get them interested? Are they going to have any prior knowledge about this, or is this the first time they're going to be reading about it? How do they learn? What's the best way that you could support your thesis so that they would eventually adopt your opinion. These are all things to think about when you're writing. At the beginning of every essay, you're going to want to develop your thesis. Now the thesis is going to be in the introduction of your persuasive, persuasive essay, but it's going to be at the end, not at the beginning. So in most papers, your thesis will be at the beginning of that introductory paragraph, but not in a persuasive essay because in a persuasive essay, you want to establish credibility first. You want to win the trust of the audience or at least their interest before you tell them what you're trying to convince them of. And one way to do this is to use an anecdote or story. If you start off your paper with a short anecdote or story, it kind of warms the audience to you. You may give them a little bit more information that lets them know you are a credible source to be talking about this topic, and then introduce your thesis. Then introduce what it is you're going to be trying to convince them of in this persuasive essay. Now, once you've established your thesis, there are several ways that you can develop it, but we're going to discuss three different persuasive essay techniques today. One is making claims. You're going to give lots of supporting ideas to your main argument, so you should have small claims along, along the way that support the central argument. You make one big claim at the beginning when you tell people what it is you're writing about, what it is you're trying to convince them of, but you're going to make several small claims along the way that support that central argument. Claims should be rooted in fact 
in observation. These claims cannot be something that is just your opinion. It can't be something you made up. You can't say, I think chocolate ice cream is the best ice cream. You could say, I think a, an ice cream parlor should serve more varieties of chocolate ice cream. And you could back that up by going and doing some research, looking to see what kind of money the store might make if they had different ice cream flavors. And you could back it up. There's facts. There's observations. There's statistics you could look at. But if you just say, chocolate's the best, there should be more chocolate, that's just your opinion. It's not a small claim that would be confirmable. And that leads us to this part. Must be confirmed. Any facts that you include, any observations must be confirmable. You must be able to go back and show where you found them, show that it's a true statement. So, with any persuasive essay, include references when possible. Show where you got this information. Don't make the reader go find it. Present it to them to show that you are being upfront about this, what you're saying is true, what you're saying is the right thing, and they should believe you. It further establishes trust with them. Another way that you can develop your thesis is with examples and expert opinions. Examples are most effective when they complement facts. So you've laid out some facts and observations. Now I'll give some examples that support those because examples are a good way to make dry facts more interesting or understandable. Sometimes a writer will present a fact and you'll say, mm, I don't really know what they mean by that. But if they give you an example to back it up, then you say, oh, that's what they meant. So using an example can make your audience understand what you're trying to tell them better and make it more interesting because sometimes facts are dry and hearing a lot of facts in a row may just be boring and may not actually pull your reader's interest toward that opinion you're trying to convince them of. If you use an expert opinion, they, your experts should have a title or credential of some sort that clearly indicates the expert's knowledge and experience in the topic. So if you're saying someone is an expert on, let's say, a certain drug, then you may want the doctor to be there to say, oh, well, amoxicillin really does have all these health benefits, and here are all the things that I can tell you about that. You want a doctor. You want him to be able to show he's got a degree in medicine. You don't want it to be just someone that comes on and says, oh yeah, I've given my kid a moxil several times and my kid always gets better after a cold. That's not what you want. You want someone who's got verifiable credentials to be an expert. Now, we've looked at making claims using facts to support your thesis and using examples and expert opinions to back those up, but you can also look at emotional appeals. Opinions are formed by emotion as well as reason. So these are going to play more on reason, more on logic, where emotional appeals are going to pull on a reader's emotions. These should be used in a proper and ethical manner. And that's important to remember. If you're going to appeal to a reader's emotions, you need to be responsible about it and make sure you're doing it the right way. And let me show you some examples to expand on that. Think about drunk driving ads. Sometimes you may see some really sad and graphic things in those ads, but what's being shown is shown to you to let you know that this is a serious issue, that people should not drive after drinking because there can be terrible consequences. Anyone using that information should be using it to support not drinking and driving. And so even though it's pulling on your emotions, it's doing it for a good reason. But then let's look at politics. A lot of times one candidate will put out an ad saying how patriotic they are, showing how they've served their country and all the ways they're patriotic. And that's really nice, but often it's going to also imply that the other candidate competing against the first one is not very patriotic. And that's usually far from the truth. 
Meanwhile, that first candidate's patriotism is going to link them to voters. Voters are going to say, oh, I really care about the country too, so I need to go with this guy because he's patriotic and the other one isn't, even though that's not true. So you don't want to mislead your audience with emotional appeals. And one other way that that can be done is with loaded language. If someone is extremely religious and they are called a fanatic, the word fanatic has a certain connotation to it that is negative. The same way if someone was environmentally conscious and someone called him a tree hugger, that has a negative connotation. So using loaded language words like that can give negative connotations and pull on a reader's emotions that way. And that's not what you want to do. You want to use it to support your argument, but not put down other things. So whenever you're writing a persuasive essay, make sure you're keeping in mind who your audience is, what their interests are, how much they may already know about the topic, and what's going to help them the most. And then you can decide if you want to use small claims along the way, expert opinions and examples, or emotional appeals to back up your thesis. But the most important thing you're going to need to do is to win your audience's trust. You want to establish that you're credible so that you can convince them that your opinion is the correct one. Point of view. The point of view is the perspective from which a story is told. And the narrator is the person who tells the story. So when we're looking for point of view, we're looking to see if we have a first person narrator or a third person narrator that's telling us the story. In first person, your narrator is going to be your main character. And they're going to be saying, I, me, we, these are the pronouns you're going to see associated with the first person narrator. If it's the main character, you're only going to get to know what the main character knows. You're only going to get to read about what that main character does or what he does with someone else. But you won't know about anything that doesn't happen involving the main character because this is written from a first person point of view and you're only going to hear from this viewpoint. Third person is the most common point of view. And you're going to see pronouns like he, she, and they. The narrator is going to talk about other characters, but the narrator is not one of the characters. And third person omniscient is very common as well. Omniscient means all knowing. So a third person omniscient narrator is going to be one who describes all other characters. So, at once. So this narrator is going to be able to tell you what every other character in the story is thinking, what every other character in the story is doing. Now they may not actually do it all in the same passage. Sometimes they split it into chapters. So one chapter is written to where the author is telling you everything that Johnny does. One chapter is split to tell you everything that Susie does. So you find out everyone's point of view, but possibly at different times. But the author is able to do all that without actually being a part of the story. So whenever you're looking for who your narrator is, the pronouns are the important thing to look at. Let's look at this passage. John walked to school every day. He and his friends were often cold and tired by the time they arrived. They were allowed to warm up by the stove before sitting in their seats. In this passage, let's look at the pronouns to help determine the point of view. And your pronouns are going to be words that take the place of nouns, such as I, me, we, he, she, they, it, you. But these are going to be the ones that are really going to set you off as markers to let you know if it's a first person or third person narrator that you're listening to. So looking through this, we have he and his friends. By the time they arrived, they were allowed to warm up by the stove before sitting in their seats. And it started with John. So the narrator is using he and they and someone's name. Now, first person could use someone's name, and that's why it's important to look at the pronouns. But the narrator starts talking about John, and then he uses all of these third person pronouns. The narrator is a third person narrator here.
Oh, let's write it out. Third person. And you know this because you're looking at the pronouns. And the pronouns are all telling you that the narrator is telling you what's happening, but the narrator is not a part of the action. So the point of view is a third person point of view. So whenever you're going to find point of view, you want to know this because the perspective of the story, who it's coming from, is important. If it's coming from a certain character, or if it's coming from a first person or a third person point of view, then you're going to have a different plot or have information, um, more intimate intima information in first person and a greater variety of information with third person. So it's always important to determine your point of view whenever you are reading a story. So just keep in mind that the best way to find that is by looking at the pronouns. I, me, and we, he, she, and they. Purpose. An author writes with one of four purposes in mind. To inform. To describe. To entertain. Or to persuade. Once we figure out which one of these four purposes the author is writing with, we will be able to better understand his or her motivations for writing. If the author is writing to inform, it will probably be nonfiction. And some examples you might see are research papers or recipes. You are getting information. The author is informing you of something. They're informing you how to do something. It's nonfiction. Their purpose is simply to inform you. If the author's purpose is to describe, it will probably be fiction. And it's going to have lots of details. A descriptive story or paper is going to elaborate on details. It's going to give you as much description as possible and a lot of times that's going to be something that's a work of fiction. While you will have details in an informational paper or, or writing of some sort, it's not going to be the same kind of details you'd get in a descriptive fictional narrative. If the author's purpose is to entertain, then it will also probably be fiction and you will have humorous and or dramatic elements. Now, something that's funny or humorous is going to be entertaining, but something dramatic can be just as entertaining as something funny. And some of the best stories are going to have humorous and dramatic elements in them. So something written to entertain is usually fiction and it will sometimes have both of the, uh, these elements or sometimes just one or the other. But it's written to entertain you, to make you feel entertained, like you are um, reading a story that you are enjoying. If the author is writing to persuade you of something, you are probably going to see an editorial or an advertisement. All those ads you see on TV are meant to persuade you to buy something, persuade you that one product is better than another. So that is where advertisements are going to be one of the primary places that you see persuasion writing. Um, an editorial in a newspaper may lean toward or against um, a certain topic or candidate in a political campaign and so those are also written to persuade you one way or the other but most people are going to see ads on almost a daily basis whether it's on the internet whether it's on the TV whether it's on a billboard driving down the highway so this is something you'll see every day whether you're trying to or not so the four main purposes an author will write with are to inform to describe to entertain or to persuade. 
And once you determine what the author's purpose in writing is, you will better be able to determine the author's motivation for crafting his work. Quotation marks are used to show that the words inside the quotation marks are someone else's, not the writer's own. So look at this sentence, come over here, Joe said. So the quotation marks right here and right here are conveying that the writer did not say come over here. Joe said come over here. So notice a few things about a sentence that um, has a quote in it. First, you open up the sentence with quotation marks. Then you capitalize the first letter of the first word inside the quotation marks. And then if you have a sentence that um, is declarative or imperative, any sentence that would end with a period if it was on its own, you end that sentence with a comma, then you have quotation marks, and then you say the rest of the sentence. So this sentence says, where did he go? Notice we open up with quotation marks, capitalize the W, but if where did he go stood by itself, it would have a question mark because it's a question. So we put a question mark right here and then close with the quotation marks. Notice that the question mark is included inside the quotation marks. It's not on the outside, it's on the inside. This sentence says, there he is, he exclaimed. So in this case, the person saying it with a lot of emotion. So that's why we ended with an exclamation mark. Now these next couple sentences are kind of inverted from the sentences we've been looking at because the quote comes later in the sentence. So this sentence says, Michael said, I can't wait for dinner. So you put a comma after said, open up with quotation marks, you go through the sentence, and then this sentence right here is declarative, so it ends with a period. And up here we ended with a comma, but here we're ending with a period because we've come to the end of the sentence and there needs to be some kind of period or question mark or exclamation mark to end out the sentence. So in this case, a period is chosen to end the sentence and then quotation marks are put at the end. Notice that the period is inside the quotation marks. This sentence says, Michael asked, what's for dinner? In this case, it's a question, so that's why we have a question mark at the end. Again, notice that it's inside the quotation marks. Now this final sentence is kind of unique. It says, I think we are having burgers, Michael said. Do you know what we are having? So right here, there's two quotes within one sentence. So it says, I think we are having burgers. So we open up with quotation marks. We have the quote right here. We end with a comma uh, because this is a, this is a declarative sentence. And then we have uh, another set of quotation marks. Then we have something outside of the quotes because we're saying that Michael said this. And then we continue on with what Michael said. So we open up with quotation marks. And it says, do you know what we are having? This is a question, so we use a question mark. And then we end with quotation marks. So those are the important things you need to remember when using quotation marks. Transitional words and phrases. Transitional words and phrases are used to guide the reader through the text. You've probably seen a lot of these common transitional words and phrases before, but you may not have thought about what their operation is, what their purpose is in the paper. So let's look at the different ways transitions can be used. You can have transitions that show time information. For instance, after, before, during, in the middle of. These all tell you when in time something is happening. You can also have transitions that indicate an example is about to be given. For example, in fact, for instance, if you say something, if you state your main idea and then you want to give a supporting example, you can say, in fact, let me tell you this thing. For example, dogs make good pets because they are very loyal. These phrases let you know that an example is coming. Transitions can be used for comparing. Also, likewise, you're saying how two things are alike. This is also like this. Likewise, we can look at how dogs are good companions. You can also use them for contrasting, saying how two things are different. However, but, yet, you would like a dog for a pet because they are so companionable, but a cat is not going to be as affectionate. They won't make as good of a companion as a dog. So you can contrast two things using however, but, yet. Transitions can be used to suggest 
addition to let you know that more is coming. And also, furthermore, these all let you know more is coming. More examples are coming, more information is coming, more details of the same sort. You can have transitions that reflect logical relationships. If, then, therefore, as a result, since, if I go to bed late, I might be tired in the morning. I went to bed late, therefore, I was tired in the morning. So these transitions reflect logical relationships. And our last example for transitional words and phrases are steps in a process. And these words show that uh, exactly. They're showing steps in a process. First, you'll gather up all your ingredients. Second, you'll mix the dry ingredients in a bowl. Last, you'll take the cake out of the oven. So these steps are telling you exactly what's happening first, second, third. They may throw in Next, after that, they may not want to just put numbered all the time, like last isn't telling you the tenth step, it just uses the transitional word last, but it still is giving you an idea of what step that is in a process. So, make sure you use your transitional words and phrases where they will orient your reader and illuminate the structure of your composition. You want to let your readers know where they are in your paper. If you're saying, first, this happens, next, this happens, or if it steps in a process, first, you do this, second, you do this. Or if you're comparing and contrasting things, you would say, well, here's this, likewise, there's this. However, there's this, if you're contrasting. And you want to illuminate the structure of your composition. If you're writing a compare and contrast essay, these compare and contrast transitional words are going to help highlight that that's what type of essay you're writing. If you're writing a persuasive essay, you might see a lot of examples. If you're writing an instructional essay, you'll see a lot of steps in a process. If you're writing an informational essay, you may have some logical relationships. So using these transitional words and phrases can help let your reader know what the purpose of your writing was. So please always include transitional words and phrases in your writing because you want to guide your reader through the text and let them know what your purpose is. Transitions are very helpful to the reader because they help the reader transition from one thought to another or one concept to another. Transitions can be placed at the beginning of a sentence or in the middle of a sentence either to help the reader transition from one sentence to another or from one part of the sentence to another part of the sentence. So I want to take a look at many different kinds of transition words and phrases that can be used and how they can be used accurately in sentences. So first of all, transitions can be broken up into different kinds of transitions. So some transitions show addition, like the transitions next and in addition. Remember I said that we can also have transition phrases, and so this is a prepositional phrase acting as a transition. Another type of transition is a summary, like in conclusion or finally. And there are some transitions that show sequence, like later or then. And then finally, some transitions show contrast, like although or meanwhile. So how can you effectively use these transitions in sentences? Many times the transition word or transition phrase needs to go at the beginning of the sentence. Like here this sentence says, next, bake the cookies for 10 minutes. So we put the transition at the beginning of the sentence and put a comma after it. Now generally, commas come in pairs in sentences when they are showing that a certain part of the sentence isn't needed. So notice here that next could be removed from the sentence and we could just read the sentence like this, bake the cookies for 10 minutes and it would still make sense. So usually when you have some kind of phrase or word that could be omitted from the sentence, you put commas on both sides of it. Like here's part of a sentence, then there's a comma, here's the part of the sentence that isn't needed, another comma, and then the rest of the sentence. But when a word or phrase comes at the beginning or the end of a sentence, you only need one comma because you wouldn't put a comma before next. That would look funny. So you just put a comma after it to show that next isn't there. 
So although next isn't essential to the sentence, it's helpful because it helps the reader understand the transition from one thought to another. In this case, the next step and directions on how to bake cookies. All right, this next sentence says, although I enjoy the outdoors, I do not like to run. Although is a transition that shows contrast. And notice here there's not a comma right after although. It's placed after outdoors. But again, although I enjoy the outdoors could be removed from the sentence, and it would still make sense. It would just say, I do not like to run. Nevertheless, this part of the sentence is still important to the overall paper. Now, notice that in certain cases, you have to continue the sentence for it to make sense. Like here, it wouldn't matter um, whether next was here or not. But since you put although right here, you have to finish the sentence. You couldn't say, although I enjoy the outdoors. Because I enjoy the outdoors makes sense by itself, but once you add although to it, you're telling the reader that there's something else that needs to come. So after you put although I enjoy the outdoors, you have to put I do not like to run to finish out the sentence. So the things that are important to remember from this session is that there are many different kinds of transitions that can be classified into different categories. And there's many more categories we could have listed and many more transitions we could have listed under each category. And then generally, the transition word or phrase is going to go at the beginning of the sentence. And in this case, where there's a phrase at the beginning of the sentence that is started off by a transition word, make sure you finish the sentence and don't leave the reader hanging by writing a fragment. ACT, reading, comprehension. We could place the term false analogy into a group called a logical fallacy, which is a failure of reasoning. And so as a reader, it is important to recognize logical fallacies because they diminish the value of the author's message. So like I said, a false analogy is a logical fallacy. And so we could also call a false analogy a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, it is when the author suggests that two things are similar when in fact they are different. So basically, a false analogy is a false comparison. So many times an author uses a false analogy when they're trying to convince the reader that something unknown is like something familiar. So the author is taking something unknown to the reader and comparing it to something familiar. Now, here the author is taking advantage of the reader's ignorance. Because like I said, this is comparing something unknown with something familiar. So the reader is not familiar with this unknown thing that we're talking about. So because of that, the author is able to take advantage of the reader's ignorance. So an example of a false analogy would be this statement right here. Failing to tip a waitress is like stealing money out of somebody's wallet. Now, of course, failing to tip is very rude, especially when the service has been good. But people are not arrested for failing to tip as they would be for stealing money from a wallet. So to compare stingy diners with thieves is a false analogy. This is an ACT video for the category of reading and then the subcategory of comprehension. False dichotomy is an example of a logical fallacy, which is a failure of reasoning. And that's just what false dichotomy is, a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, we can define false dichotomy as when the author creates an artificial sense that there are only two possible alternatives in a situation. And by doing that, the author limits both the reader's options and imagination. And so this fallacy is common when the author has an agenda and wants to give the impression that their view is the only sensible one. And so readers should always be suspicious 
of the false dichotomy. When an author limits alternatives, the reader must ask, is the author being valid? Now, an example of false dichotomy is, you need to go to the party with me, otherwise you'll just be bored at home. And so here, the speaker suggests that the only other possibility besides being at the party is being bored at home. This is not true, as it is perfectly possible to be entertained at home, or even to go somewhere other than the party. And so this is an example of false dichotomy, because here the author is creating that artificial sense that there are only two possible alternatives. One is to go to the party, and one is to be bored at home. And remember that I said the author wants to give the impression that their view is the only sensible one. And so here, the only sensible option looks like to go to the party because who wants to be bored at home? Whereas really, there's many options and there's many sensible options in this situation. So that's why this is an example of false dichotomy. ACT, reading, comprehension. An overgeneralization is a type of logical fallacy, which is a failure of reasoning. And so that is what an overgeneralization is, a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, we could define it as when an author makes a claim that is so broad it cannot be proved or disproved. So when an author uses an overgeneralization, it's usually to accomplish one of two motives. The first is to create an illusion of authority. So the author may want to make it look like they have authority when in fact they do not. The second possible motive is to sway the opinion of the reader. Usually um, this would be accomplished by using sensational language. And so if the author was writing a persuasive essay, he may employ the use of overgeneralization to sway the opinion of the reader. Now, take a look at this example right here of overgeneralization. Everybody knows she is a terrible teacher. Now, here the author makes an assumption that cannot really be believed. It may be that most people do indeed have a negative view of the teacher, but to say that everybody feels that way is an exaggeration. Here, the author is claiming consensus when none actually exist. Now, when a reader spots an overgeneralization like this one, they should become skeptical about the argument that is being made because an author will often try to hide a weak or unsupported assertion behind authoritative language. So if you see a statement like this and you can recognize it as an overgeneralization, know that that means that the author is probably trying to hide a weak or unsupported assertion behind authoritative language. In this video, we want to go over prefixes. Prefixes are short little sections of words that come before the root of a word and help you understand what the word means. They add uh, an extra nuance to the word and why prefixes and suffixes for that matter are important. Prefixes coming before the root of the word, suffixes, short little endings after the word, is that if you know your basic prefixes and suffixes, they help you determine the meaning of a word. And they're important clues, especially if you're taking a standardized test where they say we want you to find the word with the opposite meaning. Sometimes just knowing the prefix can give you enough of a clue, even if you don't know what the root means, to find the opposite. Um, we've got a few examples on the board and we want to go through those briefly just to show you the importance of prefixes, how they can help you in your test taking strategies, and how they can help you understand the meanings of words. So prefixes give clues as to a word's meaning. Knowing them can help you find the word with the opposite meaning on a test. So words like uh, prefixes like pre, um, here we think pre-operative, pre-op, that means before the operation, or prescient, uh, pre meaning before, and scient from the word science, which means knowledge, so to know ahead of time. So prescient is to know ahead of time. Uh, pre-game show, the, the part that comes before the game. So pre means before, the opposite of pre is post. Post-operative care, the care that happens after the operation. Post-game show, the show that happens after the game. So pre is before, post is after. If you realize this 
um, opposites, then if you see a word that's got a pre-prefix on it, then you look for a word with a post-prefix on it if the test is asking you to find the opposite. Another thing would be pro and d. So pro means for, as in pro-life. Uh, someone who is pro-life is for life. Um, uh, DE is the negation, so deconstruction, to deconstruct is the opposite of, uh, of the negation of construction. Construction to build up, deconstruct to destroy. So pro uh, meaning for, D is uh, usually a negation, pre before, uh, post after. Knowing your prefixes can be critical, um, especially if you're not sure of the whole word. You can say, well, let me break this word up into its prefix, its root, and its suffix and see if I can't uh, decode just from that minimal information the proper answer on the other side. Now obviously when you're taking a test if you know the right answer you always go with the right answer but if you're struggling if you're not sure this is a strategy you can use. You can look at the word break it down and say hmm here's the prefix and I know it means this and I'm being asked to find the opposite. What's the opposite of this prefix? Then I've got my answer more than likely. Caution though. Caution. Con and pro are opposites, but Congress is not the opposite of progress, although some people might disagree. Uh, that's more of a joke in terms of Congress being the opposite of progress, but uh, con and pro are opposites, but you have to know and be careful sometimes. Anyway, that's been just a basic introduction and uh, overview of the importance of prefixes as a test-taking strategy of knowing what they mean uh, to help you determine the meaning of a word and also to assist you if you're being asked to look for the opposite. If you know what the prefix means and you know what the opposite of that prefix is, it makes it a snap to find the right answer. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll see a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. While you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. An alliteration is a stylistic or literary technique. It's basically when successive words begin with the same sound or the same letter. So consider this sentence, she walked through the thick thorny grass. Notice that through the thick and thorny, I'll start with th. And so remember the definition of an alliteration are words that begin with the same sound or the same letter. In this case, they begin with the same letter and they start off with the same sound. So that's why this sentence is an example of an alliteration. Now I said this was a literary technique and literary techniques generally are there for a reason. In this case it's to show the difficultness of getting through the grass because saying four words that start with a TH in a row is somewhat difficult. It's kind of a tongue twister. Through the thick thorny grass. Through the thick thorny grass. I couldn't say that ten times fast because it's difficult. And that's the point of the author here. They're trying to um, help the reader understand the difficulty of walking through this grass by making it difficult to say. And so this technique is used um, in the opposite way around in poetry. Many times um, letters or sounds that sound good three or four times in a row are used to give the poetry a musical sound so that it sounds very pleasant to the ear. Take a look at another example. Right here it says glassy globes of glitter. Here the author is trying to describe someone's beautiful eyes. So they use the phrase glassy globes of glitter. So this is an alliteration because it these three words all start with GL. Now, of course, you may be thinking, okay, um, it said successive words, and right here, of is in between those. Well, it's okay um, for one word in there not to start with the same sound. That's all right. But glassy globes of glitter are the words we're focusing on here. Now, the, the two letters it starts out with are GL, and GL is difficult to say in a row. It's kind of like the effect of here. But in this case, we're not talking about something that's difficult. We're talking about something that's beautiful, some pretty eyes. And so the author shouldn't have used these words because it makes it sound like the eyes aren't very pretty. Because up here, the purpose was to make it hard for the reader to say because they were talking about how terrible the grass is. But if you're talking about how, something beaut how beautiful something is, then the words describing it should also sound beautiful. So the writer could still use an alliteration, but they should pick letters or sounds that sound better when they are repeated. A technical passage is a piece of writing used to describe a complex object or process. 
So that's the main point of a technical passage, to describe a complex object or process. Because of that, a technical passage is always going to be nonfiction. Many times technical passages will relate to something in the medical or technological fields. I'm just going to abbreviate technological. So technical passages could be about many different types of fields, but generally things in the medical and technical fields are complex, so that's why a lot of technical passages will relate to those fields. So the goal of an author when writing a technical passage is to state everything simply and clearly. In order to accomplish that goal, the author has several tactics it will often use to state everything simply and clearly. The first is by putting everything in a logical order. The second tactic is to use subheadings and headings. And the third tactic is to use letters and numbers. That sounds very vague, but what I'm talking about here is by numbering the main points or using letters to separate sections of the paper. And because of uh, using lots of subheadings and headings and letters and numbers, oftentimes a passage will appear more like an outline than an actual piece of writing. But nevertheless, that's fine because the goal of the writer here is to describe the complex object or process simply and clearly. So that's the important thing to pay attention to there. So just to review, a technical passage is for the purpose of describing a complex object or process. And everything needs to be stated simply and clearly. So the three tactics an author can use are logical order, subheadings and headings, and letters and numbers. A bar graph is a common way to present information in a visual format. So in a bar graph, you have a y-axis, which is this line right here. The vertical line is the y-axis. And the x-axis is this line right here, the horizontal axis. So a bar graph shows the relationship between the x-axis and the y-axis. So here, we're looking at basketball players and their heights. So here we have the players, and here we have their heights on the left and feet. So to make this graph complete, so, so that we can start graphing the heights of these players, we first need to label the y and x axis. So over here we have height in feet. Because we don't have these units labeled right here. These could be meters, centimeters, but in this case it's feet. Height in feet. Then over here we have players. Even though that's pretty obvious, we still need to label each axis. So right here, this is the name of the x-axis, the players, and then we get more specific when we get closer to the x-axis. The same thing here. Vertically, we have height and feet, and then we go over here and we have specifically the different heights. So now we need a name for this graph, and the great thing about a title or a name for a graph is that a reader can quickly look at the graph and determine its content. So here we're going to name this players' heights. Because what we have here is a representation of the heights of the different players. So finally, we need to take the information we have right here and put it in this graph. Because although we have the heights of the different players, we want to put it in a graph format because that provides a visual way for someone to understand this information. So for player A, we see that that person is 7 feet tall. So we're going to go over to player A, and then we're going to go up to 7 feet. We're going to draw a line right there and come down like this. And this is why it's called a bar graph, because it's a bar. Now B is 6.7 feet. So we go over to player B, and we notice that 6.7 isn't actually labeled anywhere on here. But So we're just going to guess that 6.7 is about right there, a little bit higher than 6.5. And again, we're going to draw a bar. Then player C is 5.9 feet. Again, that's not specifically on here, but we're going to go just below the 6-foot mark, come down, have our third bar. Then our fourth and final player, player D, is 6.3 feet. 
So we're going to go a little over halfway between 6 and 6.5 and get right there. Now, you may be familiar with a line graph, is where there's plots, points like this, and there's lines connecting the dots. It looks like that. Well, that shows over time how something rises or changes or remains constant. Here, we're not looking at really how something's progressing over time. We're just looking at each player and their height. And it also provides a great way to compare the different players' height. Because right here, you're kind of wondering, OK, how do these players' heights relate to each other? Well, right here, you can kind of visualize each bar right here and how much taller the players are than each other. So you can realize that the difference between player B and player D is smaller than the difference between player A and player C. And although you may be thinking, oh, that's obvious from the information right here, it's much easier to visualize right here in a bar graph. A bias is basically when an author is unfair or inaccurate in his or her presentation of something. In their attempt to persuade, writers often make mistakes in their thinking patterns and writing choices. This is because every author has a point of view. And that's important to remember. Every author has a point of view, which is basically just the way they look at something, the way they see a certain situation. So because they have this point of view, naturally in their writing, they oftentimes will show their point of view through their writing. And so that's when a bias comes into play. So it's not necessarily bad for an author to have a point of view. They're just naturally going to have one. But it is a problem when they start to include it in their writing. So that's when a bias comes into play. And so a bias is when someone ignores reasonable counter-arguments or distorts opposing viewpoints. So you as a reader need to be aware when an author is being biased. So look for any clues like when they only talk about their own arguments for something and don't talk about any opposing ideas. Or when you are aware of another viewpoint and they share the viewpoint, but they don't share it exactly correct. So be aware of those types of things. And then once you are tipped off once that a writer is being biased, you will know that other times they, when they present opinions, that those opinions may also be biased. Characters are an essential part of every story. So characters can be classified into two main categories, flat and round. The terms flat and round pertain to how much the character changes throughout the story. So flat characters have little change in personality throughout the story, or many times no change in personality. They're very predictable. They're always the same. And because they're predictable, they can be considered not very interesting. So that's why they play small roles in the story. The main characters of a story are never going to be flat characters. Instead, they're going to be round characters because round characters incur lots of change throughout the course of a story. So they play the main roles. So flat characters and round characters both contribute a lot to a story. Obviously, round characters are needed to play the main roles because they're going to be developing and changing a lot. And that's what moves the plot along. The plot is moved along by changes and characters' personalities. Flat characters are also needed, however, because they play the smaller roles in the story, the supporting roles that make the main characters very interesting. So when we're talking about round characters, you probably heard me use the word development. And that's what authors try to do with round characters. They try to develop the characters. And it's the development of the characters that moves the plot along. If the characters stay the same, the characters stay the same throughout the entire story, then the plot's not very interesting because the plot's not going to progress very much. So round characters are essential to moving the plot along. But the important thing to take away from this, if you remember one thing, is that characters can be split up into flat characters and round characters. Flat characters having the same personality and round characters changing in personality throughout the story. The text used to support an argument must be credible, or another word for credible would be believable. And it's important for writers to be credible so that the re reader will believe their writing. So there's a couple of important things that an author should do in order to be credible. First, they need to be knowledgeable on the subject. And 
and second, they need to be unbiased. So when we talk about being knowledgeable, I'm saying that the writer needs to understand what they are writing about. Consider if you were looking at two reports about the ozone layer. One was written by an environmental scientist and the other by a hairdresser. You are more likely to believe the report written by the environmental scientist than the report about the ozone layer by the hairdresser. Why? Because the environmental scientist knows more about the ozone layer, or at least you believe that they do. So that's why it's important to be knowledgeable in order to be believable. And the second important trait is to be unbiased. And that means the author doesn't need to have a special agenda at hand. They need to present all viewpoints equally and fairly instead of casting one viewpoint in a negative light or um, casting another viewpoint in a positive light. So those are the two most important traits in order to be credible or believable. And or, in order to decide uh, whether an author is credible, you need to look at their motivations. In other words, you need to know why they are writing the paper. If it's to persuade the reader, then you know they are not going to be very credible because they may skew certain facts to try to persuade you. But if they're just presenting information, just for the purpose of presenting information to the reader, then they are most likely credible. When defining words found in a text, often words have a, a definition that is more than the dictionary definition. So we can say that words have two definitions, a denotative meaning and a connotative meaning. The denotative meaning is the literal meaning of the word. So basically, if you're wondering what the word meant and it's the denotative meaning, then you could just look up the word in a dictionary, and the dictionary definition would describe the meaning of that word. However, the connotative meaning of the word also involves the emotional reaction a word may invoke. It depends on the reader's associations they may make with that word. So it goes further than the denotative meaning. And so denotative meanings are generally used in nonfiction works. Whenever um, in a nonfiction work the writer isn't trying to be flowery or use figurative language, so the actual definition of the word is what the word means in that context. However, in fiction works, the connotative meaning of a word also is, uh, is often meant. So it's important that readers learn to differentiate between when the connotative or denotative word or denotative meaning is being used. And so the reader can usually determine by the context clues whether the author is using the denotative or connotative meaning of a word. Almost any type of writing is descriptive and then it seeks to describe a certain person, place, thing, or idea. But a descriptive text is more specific, and then it takes one particular subject and then tries to depict that clearly to the reader. So we could say that a descriptive text focuses on one subject. So it focuses on one subject and then tries to depict that subject clearly to the reader. And when you think of describing something, that means using lots of adjectives and adverbs, lots of descriptive words. So, as you can imagine, a descriptive text is going to have lots of adjectives and adverbs. So I'm just going to abbreviate adjective and adverb. So when you think about a descriptive text, that means it's going to include details. So you want lots of details in a descriptive text. That's what the writer is going for. So over here you have too many details. Because even though you're trying to, the writer is trying to include lots of details, there can be too many. But on the other end of the spectrum over here, if there's not enough details, the paper can be vague or unclear. So what the writer is trying to accomplish here is a happy medium, somewhere in the middle where the paper is not vague or unclear. It, it's very clear and very precise, but there's not so many details that the reader gets bogged down in all of the extra information. So as a writer, um, you should look to try to go in the middle in a descriptive text. And if you're reading something, you want to read things that are descriptive where the writer has a good balance of details in the paper.
A dictionary is a great resource for finding out a number of things about a particular word. All the words in a dictionary are going to be categorized in alphabetical order, which makes finding a word very easy. There are a number of components that each dictionary entry is going to have. So first of all, there's going to be a pronunciation guide. This is to help the reader understand how to say the word. There will also be a listing of the parts of speech that that word can be, depending on the sentence it's in. So some words might be able to be an adjective or an adverb, and other words might always be a verb. In addition to that information, it may also include an etymology, which is, a, which is the, uh, the language that the word originally came from and the word's definition in that language. And then a dictionary entry will always contain the definition of the word in English. Now, while many people think that only a words, only words and definitions are included in a dictionary, you see here there's also other information. And that's because someone may look up a word in a dictionary to figure out how to pronounce it or to figure out what's, um, what parts of speech it can be. So the, finding the definition of a word is only one of the uses for a dictionary. So down here I have a sample entry in a dictionary, and this really only contains the parts of speech and the definition of the word. So see here that well can be an adverb or a noun. So right here you have the definition for well when it's an adverb, which means in a good way. And when well is a noun, it means a hole drilled into the earth. And notice here that there's the number one. That's because there could also be a number two. Maybe there could be two definitions for well when it's an adverb or two definitions for well when it's a noun. Some words may always just be one part of speech. So say a word is always a noun. There could be three or four, maybe even more, definitions for that word when it's announced. So all of those would be listed here in the dictionary entry. So the best way for a reader to determine which is the correct definition of a word is to replace the, the word in the sentence with the dictionary definition. So if the sentence said, the person fell into the well, you could replace well with these two definitions to see which one seems correct. So the first sentence would say, the person fell into in a good way, or the person fell into a hole in the ground, or a hole drilled into the earth. So obviously here, well is a noun, so we would go with this definition of the word. A drama is a play written to be spoken aloud. So many times you might find yourself actually reading a play, instead of actually watching a performance of it. So when you're reading a play instead of watching it, it's essential that you use your imagination. When reading a play instead of watching it, you can't see characters interact with each other. You have a harder time imagining the setting of the stage because you're just reading it. So that's why it's essential that you use your imagination to fill in any missing gaps. So while there are downsides to reading a play instead of watching it, there are some positives. For one, you have freedom of point of view. When you're reading a drama, you as the reader get to decide what the characters look like, what the setting is like, and what the atmosphere as a whole is like. And when you're watching a play, the actors decide that for you. So you have a freedom of point of view when you're reading the drama. You also have extra information when you're reading a drama instead of watching it. Many times the author of the drama will have side notes, or if you're reading an older play like a Shakespeare play, there may be things in the, the footnotes that help tell more about the setting or why this is like that. And also, plays that are older and hard to read because of the older English text, there may be footnotes that tell you how to read it in modern English. So that can be helpful, and if you were watching a play, you wouldn't have any of that extra information. So that's another positive. And the third positive is you have time to study the drama. The drama passes by very quickly when you are watching it, but when you are reading it, you have time to stop, look up the meaning of words, read some more about the play, or gather any additional information that you think would help you better understand the drama. So again, when you're um, reading a play instead of watching it, make sure you're using your imagination. And, Fill in any blanks, and then remember the positives here. Make sure that you use your freedom of point of view and read the extra info, and do some extra study. There is one point I should make, though. The most important part of a drama 
is speech or dialogue. In many other works of literature, that's not necessarily the case. But here, the main part of drama is going to be the characters' interactions with each other, which generally comes through speech. So if you're analyzing a drama, speech and dialogue is what you're looking for. The purpose of an expository passage is to enlighten and inform the reader. But to state it more simply, the purpose of an expository passage is to teach. Because the purpose of this type of passage is to teach, everything here is going to be accurate. So that's why it's always going to be in a nonfiction passage. The topic of a passage of this type is always going to be very simple. It's going to be a simple topic. It's also going to be a very easily defined topic because the writer of a type, one of these types of passages wants the reader to be able to understand what they are saying very easily because they're trying to teach them something. So it's going to be, everything's going to be very simply stated so that the reader can understand what the writer is saying. Oftentimes, expository passages will contain words like first, next, for example, or therefore. The reason these types of words would be used is because the reader, or excuse me, the writer is going to make a point that talks about the topic and then back things up uh, with certain details. So in other words, the writer is going to state a fact and then back it up with details. So you might say, this is because first, second, and finally, or next we're going to talk about this argument for our topic. Or he might give a certain example about a topic and then say, for example, or because of this, therefore. Everything is revolved around teaching. So any words like this or any other words that may go along with teaching something are going to be used in these types of situations. So the important thing to remember is that an expository passage is meant for teaching and it's going to be nonfiction. Authors will oftentimes try to express feelings. So it's important that you as a reader recognize when an author is trying to express feelings. So first of all, let's take a look at some situations in which a writer may express their feelings. It may be when they're giving a personal story or telling about a personal situation. And personal situations are, like it sounds, very personal to them. It pertains directly to them. It's something they've experienced. So strong emotion will come out of that and they're going to express their feelings. Often if a writer is trying to persuade someone then there will also be strong feelings as the writer is trying to arouse the emotions of the reader to get them to think a certain way or to take a certain action. You can know that a writer is trying to express feelings when they use phrases like I felt or I sense. Here the writer is inserting their own opinions. They're not giving facts. They're talking about their own opinions and here they're going to be talking about feelings because Feeling something, like it says, I felt, so that's a feeling, or I sense something, that's also a feeling. So those kind of phrases can tip you off that some kind of personal emotion or personal feeling is coming. It's important that you recognize these strong emotions. Recognize when strong emotions are portrayed or when certain feelings are expressed. Because you, as the reader, don't want to fall into the trap of giving too much sympathy to the writer. Because if you fall into the trap of falling into all the emotions of the writer, then it's going to be hard for you to look at the text objectively and try to understand the text better and to evaluate it. So you need to kind of distance yourself from the emotions of the writer so that you can evaluate what you are reading. So the important thing to remember is that an author will express feelings when talking about a personal situation or when they are trying to persuade. And it's important that you as the reader recognize these strong feelings.
A figure of speech is one type of literary technique that's sometimes used to enhance a text or provide clarity. But sometimes a figure of speech can reduce clarity and make it hard to determine the actual meaning of the word. A figure of speech is basically a word or phrase that departs from straightforward, literal language. So if a word is used in a figure of speech, you wouldn't be able to look up the definition of that word in the dictionary. Well, you could look up the definition of the word, but it wouldn't be the correct definition in, in this context. Instead, the definition of the word used in a figure of speech is drawn from the text around the word, the context it's used in, basically. Look at this sentence, I'm going to crown you. I'm going to crown you could have four different possible meanings. It could mean I'm going to place a literal crown on your head. It could mean I'm going to symbolic, symbolically exalt you to the place of kingship. I'm going to punch you in the head with my clenched fist. I'm going to put a second checker to signify that it has become a king. So here, I'm going to crown you as a figure of speech because it departs from straightforward literal language. I'm going to crown you doesn't necessarily imply what is going to happen. Thus, it's a figure of speech because there's several possible meanings and the reader just has to determine the meaning of this figure of speech from the context around it because in some passage this sentence is going to be surrounded by other sentences and if the person's talking in the context of board games then the reader could probably assume that I'm going to crown you means I'm going to put a second checker on or if the person or if the passage mainly talks about kings and queens then the person could the reader could imply that I'm going to crown you means I'm going to place a literal crown on your head. The reader just has to use the context to determine the meaning of a figure of speech. A great way to organize ideas from a text is by using a graphic organizer. And a graphic organizer is basically a way to simplify information and just take the key points from the text. So you can see why this would be helpful for a reader, because it helps the reader determine the main points and see how the main points are connected to other main points. So one type of graphic organizer is the timeline. And this helps the reader determine the main points and then determine chronologically when those main points took place, because you're going to have a line here, you have different points, and so main points are going to go under these vertical lines here along the horizontal line, depending on uh, when they took place, first, second, or last. Another great form of, of, graphic, of a graphic organizer is the outline, because here the reader is determining main points and then the subpoints that go along with those main points. So it helps the reader determine what is most important and what is second, or what is secondly important. The spider map is also a great resource. Here the, the reader takes a circle and puts the main point inside of the circle and then draws legs off of this web here or off this circle to make a web and then at the end of each point is another main point and then main points can even branch off of these um, so really what you have here is you have the, the main point or maybe the thesis of the whole paper then you have the main points coming off of that thesis and then you might even have sub points coming off of those main points then there also is the Venn diagram and this is helpful in determining main points and seeing how the main points of the passage are connected to others because you may have some circles like this and so here you have a main point inside of each circle and so you can see how some main points are connected and overlapping with another main point and then some main points are overlapping with two other main points and so it helps the reader determine the main points and helps them to determine how the main points are connected with the other main points Every piece of writing should have a logical conclusion, and it's your job as the reader to identify that conclusion, mainly for the purpose of helping you to understand whether you agree with the writer or not. Because you don't want to just read a piece of literature, you want to analyze it. So one step in that process to better understanding it is identifying the conclusion to know whether you agree with the writer or not. So now I want to talk about how to identify that conclusion. So you're going to need to infer a lot, or make an inference. And to infer something just means to take what you already know and combine it with something else to draw a conclusion. So it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to combine two things. What you already know 
with the info or the information found in the text. So I'm going to draw a double arrow there because to make an inference, you're pulling these two things together, everything you find in the text, any pre-knowledge you have, and you're pulling that together to draw the conclusion. And generally, a conclusion should be obvious. If a writer does a good job in their writing, then the conclusion should be easily identifiable. Otherwise, you may draw a conclusion that is not the conclusion the writer had in mind. But nevertheless, it's important that you as the reader analyze the writing and identify the logical conclusion. An informative text is a very straightforward piece of writing. Basically, the purpose of an informative text is to educate and enlighten the reader. It's basically to convey information from the writer to the reader. So it's very straightforward because it's not persuasive and so it pertains more to facts and figures. So first off, an informative text is generally non-fiction because it has no reason to be fiction because it again it has facts, facts and figures in it so it's truthful. So that's why it's always non-fiction. It's generally easily comprehensible because the writer wants the reader to understand what the writer is talking about. So they want it to be easily comprehensible to the reader so that the reader can understand everything that's going on. There will also be a clear structure to the paper. Since it's informative, it will oftentimes have several points or pertain to several things. So many times it will um, go from one point to the next, a very clear structure throughout the entire paper. And like we've been saying, it'll have facts and figures in it. And so there won't be really emotional language. It'll be more straightforward. And then also, an informative text generally does not have personal opinions in it. Because there's no reason to have personal opinions. Because the writer isn't trying to convince the reader in any way. They're trying to just simply convey information to the reader. So that's why personal opinions are not present and are not needed. So the important thing to remember is that an informative text is meant to educate and enlighten the reader. Irony is a statement that suggests its opposite. Look at this example. A man walks in his home covered in mud and in tattered clothes. His wife says, how was your day? And the man replies, great. This is an example of irony because obviously the husband did not have a great day. He went through some kind of major conflict where he now is covered in mud and has tattered clothes, but he still says his day was great. So this is irony because irony is when the literal meaning is different than the intended meaning. Here the literal meaning of what the husband said is that he had a great day. But the intended meaning is to say, I actually had a terrible day and that's why he's saying great because this is an example of irony. Now you may think this, that this is a sarcasm. But irony is different than sarcasm. Like I said, irony is a statement in which the literal meaning is opposite from the intended meaning. Sarcasm is also a statement in which the literal meaning is opposite from the intended meaning, but it's also meant to be insulting to the person at whom it is directed. A sarcastic statement suggests that the other person is stupid enough to believe an obviously false statement is true. Irony is a bit more subtle than sarcasm. A metaphor is a type of figurative language in which the author equates one thing with that of something else. This sentence says, the bird was an arrow arcing through the sky. Now here, the bird wasn't actually an arrow, but instead the author is saying the bird is like an arrow arcing through the sky. This is a way for the author to get to think about the bird in a different way and to equate it with an arrow and an arrow making an arc through the sky. This is a way for the author to describe the bird in more detail without being direct and obvious because the author could say the bird swiftly flew through the air and bit through the air making a big arc but that's not very interesting that doesn't evoke emotion on the part of the reader so instead in this case the author chose to use a metaphor saying the bird was like an arrow arcing through the sky and because of that the reader can conclude that the bird must have flown swiftly and then bent through the sky maybe going up and then coming back down now sometimes authors use metaphors but they don't directly tell you what they're talking about. Here we knew that the author was talking about a bird, but look at this sentence. Swaying skeletons reached for the sky and groaned as the wind blew through them. 
Here, we don't know exactly what the author is talking about, but we can uh, infer that the author is talking about trees because it would make sense that trees would sway back and forth and that maybe at this point it's in the winter and the, the trees don't have any limbs, so it's just like the skeleton of a tree and it's swaying back and forth. So that would make sense here, and so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to figure out exactly what the author is talking about. In this case, it wasn't, but nevertheless, this is another example of a metaphor where the author is comparing the trees to skeletons, and that allows the reader to look at the trees in a different perspective. Now we're thinking about trees as big skeletons swaying back and forth and groaning. And so that's a way for the author to give us a different perspective about these trees without being real direct and obvious. So just to review, a metaphor is, when the, is a type of figurative language in which the author equates one thing to that of something else. A narrative is basically a piece of writing that is a story. So I'm going to write that up here on the board because that's important to remember, that a narrative is a story. Now, notice in the word narrative that it kind of sounds like the word narrator or narration. Now, when you think of a narrator, it's generally the person in a play that guides the audience through the story and tells what's going on. So in the same way, a narrative, a narrative is basically telling the reader a chain of events. So it gets the story, and then it can be nonfiction or fiction, as long as it is a story. Now, there are certain characteristics that a piece of writing must have in order to be considered a narrative. First of all, it must have a plot. A plot is basically the meat of the story. It uh, starts out with the problem that arises in the story, and then how the characters try to overcome that problem, and then finally ends with the characters overcoming the problem. So I know you noticed that I talked about the characters doing things in the plot. So that's the second thing that a narrative must have, characters. These characters can be people, animals, or things. But generally it's going to be people. There has to be some kind of interaction between the characters in order to form the plot, which forms the narrative. And then finally, a narrative is going to include figurative language. Figurative language is basically something that's not totally true. Like think of a metaphor, which is a type of figurative language. Like if I were to say, the moon was a frosty snowball. Look at that sentence, the moon was a frosty snowball. So notice here, the moon wasn't actually a frosty snowball. But basically, the writer is saying the moon looked like a frosty snowball. So that's an example of figurative language, because this is an example of a metaphor. So any kind of narrative is going to include sentences like this one that leave um, some things up to the reader's imagination. So the important thing to remember about a narrative is that it tells a story. Sometimes after reading a passage, it can be helpful to write an outline. And outlining is helpful because it aids in the drawing of conclusions. So overall, um, an outline should accomplish two things. It should reveal the structure of the passage, and two, like I said earlier, it should lead to solid conclusions. There are many ways uh, to structure an outline, but I want to go over one approach that works very well, and that's to first to have a title, which is basically the main idea of the whole passage, so you don't have to write it word for word. And then you have main ideas under Roman numerals. So these are your big general ideas. You're not getting very specific yet. Then under your main ideas, you have supporting ideas and details. Throughout the passage, there are sure to be many details. And so when I talk about including details here, you don't need to include every detail. Just include details that are central 
to the argument or message. So remember, like I said, outlines are helpful because they aid in drawing conclusions and they reveal the structure of the passage. So remember to draw an outline or make an outline after you read a passage that you cannot find the conclusion of. Personification is a type of figurative language in which the writer describes the non-human as having human qualities. So look at this elementary example of personification. The car smiled at me. Here the car is described as smiling, but smiling is a human quality. So the car, the fact that the car smiled is personification because the car here didn't actually smile because it's not a human. But for whatever reason it appeared to the rider that the car smiled at them. Maybe the front of the car is configured in such a way that it looks like a face and it looks like it's smiling. Or maybe it was more of just the rider's imagination. But whatever the case is an, is an example of personification because the rider is giving a human quality, smiling, to a non-human. Now sometimes personification can include giving human qualities to animals like in George Orwell's book Animal Farm where animals um, reenact an entire war. So that can be the case as well. But generally I think of personification as pertaining to inanimate objects, but it can be animals as well. The tree groaned in the wind is another example of personification. Here the tree is a non-human, yet the author is giving it this human quality of groaning. Now you may think, okay, if a tree is going back and forth in the wind, it may sound like it's groaning. Well, yes, it may sound like it's groaning, but here the author is saying that the tree actually groaned, which cannot be true because trees don't have mouths. So this is an example of personification, like I said, because although the tree made a groaning sound, the tree did not actually groan. Personification can be used for a variety of reasons, but often it's to make the reader look at something with a different perspective. Personification evokes a different tone than if, like, consider this sentence. If the author just said, the car looked like it was smiling at me, that sentence sounds different than, the car smiled at me. So depending on whatever tone the author is going for, the author may choose to use or not to use personification. A prediction is a guess about what will happen next. So when a reader actively engages in whatever they are reading, they naturally make predictions about what will happen next. And they base these predictions off of what they have read, and what they already know. So by taking what they have read and what they already know, a reader can formulate what they think will happen next in the story. So consider this sentence. Staring at the computer screen in shock, Kim blindly reached over for the brimming glass of water on the shelf to her side. So the reader is naturally going to read this and have an idea of what is going to happen next. And the reader will probably notice the word blindly. So Kim is so caught up in what's happening on the computer she goes for a drink of water, but since she's caught up on what's go going on on the computer, she reaches over without really looking at the glass of water to grab it. So the reader is going to assume that she's going to knock over the glass of water. Now, that may not be what happens, but still it's a prediction either way. A prediction may come true, and a prediction may not come true. But a reader is naturally going to make predictions about a passage, and it's, uh, making predictions is part of being actively engaged in what the reader is reading. There are many ways to structure a particular piece of writing. One common way to organize a paper, especially in nonfiction writing, is by presenting a problem and then presenting a solution. So I'm going to write problem here and then draw an arrow to solution. Because that is how the paper or the, the piece of literature would be structured. First the author would present the problem and then present the solution. Now in some cases the problem may already be well known to the reader. In this case, the writer may talk briefly about the solution, 
then talk about the problem, and then talk in more depth about the solution. Notice that I wrote solution very small here, because that's how the paper would be structured. The writer would briefly talk about the solution, then talk lots about the problem and lots about the solution. In some cases, an author may feel like there are more than one viable solutions. So I'm going to write problem, and then draw three, er three arrows to solutions. So it's important when reading a paper that first presents a problem, then a solution, that you understand the author's agenda, as well as their point of view. So first of all, their agenda. You want to know why the author is writing the paper, and if they feel like one particular solution is in their best interest. So if a paper is structured like this with a problem and several solutions, the author may be biased towards one solution and feel like their solution is the best. And so they may uh, cast the other solutions in a negative light. So they would, even though they would present several solutions, they would highlight one and put down the other solutions. In some cases, the author may present a problem and only present the solution that they feel is best, even though there are other good solutions. So sometimes only one solution is good, and so that's why the author only presents one solution. But sometimes there are more than one solutions that could be, could be good for uh, the problem. And so when the author only presents one solution, instead of even addressing the other solutions, they're totally ignoring them. So that's another example of an agenda and being biased towards one solution over another. So it's important that you as a reader understand both the re writer's agenda and point of view when looking at the problem and the solution. The purpose of an author is basically why the writer wrote the paper. It's what motivated them to write something. So there's three basic types of motivations or purposes of an author. They either wrote something to inform, entertain, or persuade. So it's important as a reader to understand the purpose of the author because it helps you better understand the text. So generally, it's pretty easy to determine what type of paper something is. So an informative paper is basically when the reader or the writer is just giving the reader facts about something. They're telling them more about something. A paper that is meant to entertain is generally fiction. It's pretty much any kind of fiction work is meant to entertain. Now, occasionally, Fiction will serve a double purpose of also trying to inform, trying to persuade. But generally, um, when something's meant to entertain, generally means that it's some kind of fiction piece. Then finally, the third type, or the third purpose, is to persuade. And this is actually the hardest type to determine, because generally, an author is going to try to hide that they're trying to persuade you. Because when someone knows they're trying to be persuaded, they're going to be wary or skeptical of the arguments that the writer is throwing at them. So a lot of times a writer will try to disguise their persuasive paper as a paper that's meant to inform or a paper that's meant to entertain, but actually it's meant to persuade the reader. So those are the three main types of purposes of an author, to inform, to entertain, or to persuade. A sequence is the order in which things happen. So it's important that a reader be able to identify the sequence so they can follow along with what is happening in the passage. So a sequence is basically the order in which things happen, or the order of events. To help spot the sequence in a passage, you can look for words like first, then, last, and next. So if you find these words in a passage or other words like it, you'll know that that's showing you some part of the sequence. And so that helps you determine what happened first, then next, and then last. And finally, most sequences will be in chronological order. Basically, chronological means uh, based on time. So if I was talking about my day, I would say, okay, at 7 o'clock I got up, at 7.30 I ate breakfast, at 8 o'clock I went for a run, and then at 12 o'clock I ate lunch. See, that's chronological. It's proceeding through time. Now, some texts might not be in chronological order, and so those can be more confusing when trying to find the sequence. 
However, sometimes that's the best way to go about writing certain passages. So just understand that not all passages will be in chronological order, but nevertheless, it's important that you understand the sequence of events. So to practice, take a look at this sentence. He walked in the front door and switched on the hall lamp. Notice here that none of these words are present in this passage. However, you can still find what the sequence is here. So you know that he must have walked in the front door first and then switched on the light bulb. That had to have happen second because first he had to get inside the door. So this may seem like a very simple and elementary example, but it's still important to be able to identify the sequence in a passage or sentence. A simile is a figurative expression in which the author compares one thing to that of a, another using the word like or as. So here are some examples. The sun was like an orange, eager as a beaver, nimble as a mountain goat. Here the author is using the word like, and in these two phrases the author is using the word as. Either case is fine, the author just needs to use the word like or as. And so in this sentence the author is comparing the sun to the orange, saying the sun was like an orange. And this gives the reader a different perspective on what they are reading. It now allows the reader to think about the sun in terms of an orange. No longer is the reader thinking of the sun in the sky, the reader is now imagining an orange in the sky. And here, if the author was describing someone as being nimble, no longer are they th just thinking of someone being nimble, they're thinking of that person as a mountain goat now. And so that's the point of a simile. Now if you're familiar with metaphors, similes differ from metaphors. Look at this sentence right here. This is a simile. The house was like a shoebox. Now, a metaphor, in a metaphor, like would be removed, and the sentence would just say the house was a shoebox. See, in a metaphor, the author never acknowledges that the house and the shoebox are not the same thing. However, in a simile, like stays there, and so the author is acknowledging that house and shoebox are not the same thing. They're just like one another. So the difference between a metaphor and a simile it's just kind of the emotion that the author is trying to evoke because metaphors and similes uh, evoke different tones. So the purpose of metaphors and similes is pretty much the same thing, to get the reader to think of one thing in terms of another thing. But writers will choose to use a simile or a metaphor just depending on the tone. A stereotype is basically a bias against a specific group of people or a specific place. So you as a reader need to be attentive to when someone is using a stereotype. So like I said, a stereotype is a bias against a specific group or place. And stereotypes are generally a generalization. And a generalization is basically where you look at a specific group of people and you take what is true for some of the people and apply it to everyone. Like, take for example, if I said everyone in Nebraska is a corn farmer. Now, there are many corn farmers in Nebraska, but not everyone there is a corn farmer. So I took what was true for a few people and applied it to everyone in Nebraska. So that's a mild case of a stereotype because most stereotypes are negative. You may have heard some negative stereotypes towards specific cultures, ethnicities, and religions. So anytime you as a reader notice a stereotype, recognize that that means the author is ignorant and not curious. In other words, they may not be willing to look into the details. They see something that they think is true and so then they state it as fact. So that's why I say they're not very curious. And they're also ignorant because they may be aware that they are using a stereotype, but they may not care. And so they're ignorant about that, which means they're also going to be ignorant about other things. So as a reader, be attentive to when a writer is using stereotypes. Supporting details are very important parts of a paper. It can be said that the topic and main idea of a paper is the most important part, but without supporting details, main ideas and topics are irrelevant. So basically, supporting details reinforce a larger point. 
So a writer will make a point which may take the form of a topic or a main idea of a paper. So the writer makes that point and then the writer backs up their point with supporting details. And these details are most often found in informative and persuasive text. And this makes sense because if the writer is telling you about something, each main point they make, they're also going to need to back up with more points so that you, the reader can be sure that they are um, being told accurate information. Then also in a persuasive text, if the writer is trying to get the reader to do something or to think a certain way, the writer can't just make a bunch of points. They're going to have to back up those points so that the reader will indeed think that way or take that action that the writer wants them to take. And supporting details are often easy to spot because the writer will let you know that those details are coming. A lot of times they'll make a main point and then they'll say something like first and they'll make us um, give a supporting detail and second and give another supporting detail and then say finally and then give the third supporting detail. Or they might say something like for example or for instance and that would tip you off that the next supporting detail is coming along. Supporting details need to be two things. They need to be both factual and relevant. Because if something is totally accurate and factual, but it's not relevant to the main idea, then it's no good. The supporting detail needs to be accurate and needs to uh, relate back to the main idea. And if a supporting detail is very relevant, if it pertains to the main idea, but it's not accurate, and again, it's no good because what good is information that is not true? So the important thing to remember with supporting details is that basically their job is to reinforce a larger point. And they can be most, most often found in informative and persuasive texts. They're often easy to spot because they're preceded by words like first, second, and finally, or for instance, or for example. And the most important thing for details to be is both factual and relevant. Text evidence is basically information in a text that backs up the main point or points in general throughout the story. So I want to write up some main points up here about text evidence. So like I said, it supports. The things it supports are the main point or the points throughout the story. So anytime an author makes a claim about something, it's important that they have text evidence. Because when they just make a claim, it's not very credible. And so they add text evidence to it to back up that claim, maybe give a statistic or tell something else to back up the main point or points throughout the story. And text evidence also helps the reader draw a conclusion or it leads to the conclusion throughout the story. So it's important that text evidence is three things. Precise, descriptive, and factual. Remember I said that text evidence supports the main point or points in a story. Well generally a main point and points throughout um, a piece of writing are going to be very general. They're not going to be very specific. So since these things are very general, it's important that there are some specifics in the paper. So that's why the text evidence needs to be precise. That way your paper isn't vague or the writer's paper isn't vague. It's also important that these uh, te this text evidence is descriptive because again main points and points are vague so it's important to uh, have something very descriptive. And it's also important that they're factual because since the text evidence is backing up or supporting the main points and points it's important that these facts or this text evidence is factual so that it's actually credibly backing up the main points and points throughout the story. A theme is basically an issue, an idea, or a question raised in a text. This is different than a topic or a main idea. So a theme might be something like love or triumph over diff difficult circumstances. So you might think of a topic or a main idea as what the whole paper is about, but a theme is something that's reoccurring throughout the entire book. So maybe you've been to a party before. Well, the topic of the party 
might have been so-and-so's 25th birthday party. But the theme of the party might have been a circus theme. So notice there that the, the topic of the party wasn't circus, but the theme was. So in the same way, that's kind of what a theme is. It's kind of the underlying topic of the entire paper. So there can be more than one theme in a paper. Um, that's common. And oftentimes a theme will raise more questions than it answers. It'll really get the reader thinking and it won't resolve all the issues that the theme raises throughout the entire story. And then you can find the theme by looking at issues the text is addressing. So again, it's not the topic, but it's issues and things that come up in the book or the story repeatedly. Those are the themes of the paper. And generally, there'll be something to back up a theme. Like if you were going to write a paper about the theme in another paper, you wouldn't just say, this is the theme because I think it's the theme. Anytime there's a theme in the paper, you should be able to find lots of backup data that would support the fact that that is a theme in the paper. Because, it's, again, it's something that's reoccurring throughout the entire text. The narrator plays an important role in the story. And it's important that you as a reader understand the narrator. So a narrator can talk in first person or in third person. In first person, the narrator will use pronouns like I and me because they're talking about things they're experiencing and things they see happening. And in this case, the narrator will actually be a character in the story, so it's important to understand which character they are playing. In third person, the pronouns he and she are used because the narrator is looking onto the situation saying he did this or she did this, and so they're not a character in the story. So that's one thing you need to understand about the narrator. The second thing is how much, how much does the narrator know? And you may be wondering why this is important. But some narrators are going to know what all the characters' thoughts are, and some narrators do not know that. And some narrators will be able to explain to the reader what's going on, and their thoughts about it, and some narrators will just let the plot speak for itself. So how much the narrator knows influences how much the reader will know, because however much the narrator knows, they will then tell the reader that. So it's important to understand how much the narrator actually knows. When taking your test, you may come across questions that ask you to find synonyms. Synonyms are words that have similar meaning. They don't always have the exact same meaning because there are nuances or little differences between words that may have overlap in their meanings. And so as you're looking at the word and you're looking at the options below, one of the test taking strategies that you may find helpful is to go through the choices that you have and immediately eliminate those that you know cannot be the possible answer. And that narrows the scope down until you get closer to the actual meaning. Now obviously if you know the answer you always go with what you know but if you're uncertain as to what the correct answer is then this little strategy can be helpful. You're not looking for a perfect synonym, you're looking for something that is a close synonym, something that has a, a similar meaning, an overlap in meaning, even if there's some slight nuances or little differences between the words. And so I've got an example on the board we're gonna go over this just to try to illustrate this briefly. And uh, hopefully this will help you understand the test-taking strategy of looking for the close or nearly perfect synonym if there's not one that's an exact match. So we have the word coward and we're looking for a word with similar meaning to coward. And here are our choices then below. First one, gutless. Second one, bore. Third one, judge. And the fourth one, brave. Now as you're looking at the word coward and you're looking at the choices, we can automatically eliminate one because it's not a synonym, it's an antonym. It's something with the exact opposite meaning. So brave can be ruled out automatically. We know someone who is a coward is not brave. So you've got three choices left now. You think of the word coward. Pretty sure it's not the word judge. So we were absolutely certain on this one. We're pretty sure on C. Now we're left with two answers. We've already narrowed the field. We've got a 50% chance if we just had to outright guess. 
But as we're thinking about the word coward, we think, well, you know, the word gutless comes pretty close to coward. It's not a perfect match, but it's closer than boar. And maybe we don't even know what boar, a boar is. You know, someone, oh, you're such a boar. And we're not sure what that word is, but we know that gutless has some overlap and it's close. And so if we're having to guess, once again, we're, we're not certain the answer. I'm assuming for the case of our example here that we don't automatically know that A is the answer. But we've been able to narrow it down by eliminating the choices that we know are not correct. And when we're left with two, we've been able to narrow it further by saying, I know there's enough overlap between coward and gutless that we're gonna go with A. Now, once again, this is just an example to illustrate a test-taking strategy. When you're taking your test and you come to the portion that has synonyms, if you automatically know the right answer, go with the right answer. But if you're uncertain, then basically just start looking at the answers and eliminate the ones that you know it cannot possibly be until you've narrowed it down to the ones that are possibilities and then start looking for overlap in meaning. Because often on these tests, they're not testing your ability to find a perfect synonym. They want you to be able to realize the relationship between words and the nuances between words, the little differences, so that you can say this is close to that meaning. This is the one that has at least some overlap, even though it's not a perfect match. So we're looking for nearly perfect synonyms, not the perfect synonym when we take these tests. That's part of what the testers are trying to gauge. Do you understand the subtle differences between words, not just the one that's a perfect match as in a definition? Anyway, I hope this has been helpful for you as you take your test to think through synonyms and looking for the one that's closest or has some overlap in meaning, not the perfect match, but a close match, and the strategy of eliminating answers that you know cannot possibly be the right one. If you'd like to learn more about this and other related matters, beneath this video you'll find a link. If you'll click on it, it'll take you to a website with that information. And while you're at that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download.